Hello, welcome. We are so thrilled to have Dr. Roberta Shevret here with us today. Uh, Dr. Shevret is an assistant professor in communication studies and women and gender studies here at MTSU. She completed her PhD in communications and a graduate certificate in gender studies at Arizona State University. And she holds a BA in anthropology and women's studies from Sacramento State University. Dr. Shevret is a critical rhetorical scholar committed to examining relationships among communication, identity, and social justice. Her research employs queer, feminist, and post-colonial frameworks to engage in questions of difference, representation, embodiments, and whiteness. Her research has appeared in many journals, including Communication Monographs, Communication Theory, Communication and Critical Cultural Studies, and Frontiers, a journal of women's studies. Um, along with these publications, Dr. Shevret is the co-author of a book titled Dangerous Dames, Representing Female Empowerment in Post-Feminist Media. Uh, this book illuminates the rhetorical work performed by contemporary representations of a specific type of post-feminist hero who has garnered a lot of cu cultural capital. These are women who are smart, capable, physically agile and fit, and proficient with weaponry and technology. And this will be part of her discussion with us here today. Um, Dr. Shepard has taught a number of interdisciplinary courses in communication and women's and gender studies. We are particularly thrilled that she will be teaching an interdisciplinary course here at the Honors College this spring that will be titled Rhetoric and the Racialized Other. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roberta Shevret. Thank you, Dr. King. So I am here to speak with you today about uh, representations of violent femininity in films and specifically in the movies Atomic Blonde and Proud Mary. And as Dr. King mentioned in her introduction, the topic that I'm talking about today actually is drawn from the recent published book, Dangerous Dames. And so I want to credit my co-authors of that book, Hilary Jones and Heather Hundley. And in the book, we look at this kind of this archetype figure of um, the fighting warrior woman who is sexy, but dangerous. And we see this figure as dangerous in a couple of ways. One, that these kinds of representations, they endanger patriarchy because they have women appearing in new kinds of roles and breaking free of gender stereotypes. At the same time though, they also potentially endanger women's empowerment by focusing on kind of stereotypical and sexualized reproductions. So just a few years ago in 2017, it was said that the movie Wonder Woman shattered many of Hollywood's glass ceilings because finally we had this female bodied superhero uh, center of the film and she wasn't a villain, she was the hero. And we had a woman director, the movie had a huge budget and it broke through um, all of these genres or, or these places where women really hadn't been before. However, violent heroic women were not lacking in Hollywood that year. So we had women starring in blockbusters, including Alien Covenant, Star Wars, The Last Jedi, Ghost in the Shell, Red Sparrow, and Tomb Raider. And with a few exceptions, the majority of these films featured white or light-skinned women who are young, thin, and conform to stereotypical standards of beauty. This creates a limited visual representation of violent femininity, and it normalizes this narrow definition of dangerous things. Seeing women in leading roles in action movies is not a new phenomenon. Beginning in the late 1970s, there was this constellation of forces, including shifting gender roles and an increase in women's social, political, and economic power that led to an expansion of this fierce, fighting female body figure in film. And in turn, these kinds of representations challenge stereotypical depictions of women as passive. 
However, women's entrance into the highly masculinized arena of Hollywood blockbusters in genres like Westerns, detective films, spy or assassin films, um, and superhero movies, this has meant that at the same time that these characters and the actresses are presented in these stereotypically beautiful ways and they're sexualized, their gender performances also in many ways align with masculine norms. So they're depicted as strong, as warriors, and as fighting. In line with the lecture series focus on images and icons, today's lecture is going to focus on the iconicity of these representations of violent femininity and the ways that they challenge but also reinforce gendered as well as racial stereotypes. Atomic Blonde and Proud Mary were both released around the same time and both featured a female assassin in the starring role. My purpose in comparing and contrasting these representations is to examine intersections of gender, race, and sexuality in the ways dangerous dames are portrayed in media. In the posters for the two films, we can already see some of the iconic resemblances. Both women hold guns, both wear all black, including the signature trench coat and tall boots, and both strike poses for the camera's gaze. We'll continue to unpack these kinds of visual details as we go. But first, a quick plot summary for those who haven't seen the films. In Atomic Blonde, Charlize Theron plays Lorraine, a ruthless M16 agent who faces a series of hurdles on her way to find a list of double agents. And during this process, she becomes romantically involved with another female agent played by Sofia Butella, who is later murdered. The film, which is shot in the film noir style, is filled with deception and action where no one, including Throne, is who they claim to be, and dangers are waiting around every corner. In Proud Mary, Taraji P. Henson plays Mary, an assassin for a major crime ring. The story follows Mary on her quest to save a young boy, Danny, after shooting his father, her target at the beginning of the film. When Danny appears to be in danger from Uncle, the man he's forced to sell drugs for, Mary shoots Uncle, and this initiates a war between rival crime families who, interestingly enough, are uh, white. One of the families is white and one of the families is black. Mary takes Danny home with her, and the rest of the film features her trying to escape the life of crime and build this new life with Danny. Both of these films operate in accordance with an iconic post-feminist visual style in which beautiful women literally are kicking ass. The cinematography of the two films includes a focus on women's bodies, reproducing what's called the male gaze and fetishizing women's bodies as sexual objects. The films further sexualize the women through the femme fatale figure. And this is the mysterious, well put together woman who leads to men's destruction through her sexuality and deceptive appearance. Like their predecessors in this genre, the protagonists in these films invoke a post-feminist aesthetic that sexualizes and fetishizes women's strong, dangerous bodies. The theorization of performativity can help us understand the significance of these representations. Gender performativity refers to the social construction of gender through everyday repeated performances. Although visual presentation is an aspect of gender performance, we don't just choose gender, like we choose to put on a pair of pants or a dress or mascara or to wear our hair a particular way. Instead, by repeating these various Seemingly ordinary acts related to gender roles and identities, we reproduce gender as a reality. So we take something that is itself a kind of repeated fiction and we make it a reality. So Judith Butler compares gender to a theatrical performance that's rehearsed and repeated over time. In this manner, each of us takes up a received script for performing gender and by enacting it, we make it real. So, for example, I put on this fabulous uh, zebra full-length dress today. You probably can't see the bottom of it, but I had a friend tell me that he thought I was channeling Moira Rose from Schitt's Creek. So then I thought, well, okay, my life fashion goals, uh, check, those are, those are made now. But the reason I tell this story is because 
when we see someone uh, presenting themselves in a particular way, we receive that based on all of the other images and representations we've seen. So he saw me, he thought eccentric fashion, here's this television representation. And over time, these television representations actually create this lens through which we uh, interpret and influence our own actions. So because media are sites of cultural reproduction, they can offer us insights into the sedimentation of and sometimes challenges to dominant scripts for gendered and racialized performances. Although the characters of Lorraine and Mary are sexualized and racialized differently, which we're going to explore a little bit, these films present their characters using a similar aesthetic. These two leads join the tradition of the femme fatale which is an iconic storytelling technique depicting a seductive woman as man's foil. The mythological construction of the beautiful but deadly femme fatale figure can be traced as far back as Eve, of course. We have Lilith, Adam's first wife, uh, and Pandora and her box. Cinematically, though, this figure was popularized by film noir in the mid 20th century, featuring actresses like Lana Turner, Joan Bennett and Veronica Lake, who you can see pictured in the slides. Femme fatales are dangerous because they are sexy and deadly. So they illustrate the precarity of the sexual relationship that men, by getting involved with these seductive women, risk their own fate. Visually, Atomic Blonde is characterized by shadows and the use of black and white sequences and silhouettes, which together set this dark urban mood suited to this story of sex and violence and suspicion. Its complicated plot, its grim settings, and the deceptive characters further harken back to the kind of film noir style. Like Lorraine, Mary also exhibits many of the noir femme fatale characteristics, although at the time in the 40s, of course, this representation was limited to uh, white actresses. Mary's involvement in a crime ring requires her to hide her true identity, and her urban world emphasizes deception and disguise. In fact, in the blonde wig that she dons during the film's opening scene, the visual resemblance to the atomic blonde character of Lorraine is very striking. Their gendered performance as iconic femmes becomes fatal as they wield weapons, their prowess presenting a formidable challenge to their male foes. So next, I'm going to play for you the trailers for each of the two films. And I'd like for you, as you're watching, to pay attention to how Lorraine and Mary are portrayed, looking for the similarities that you notice, as well as any differences. I chose this life. And someday, it's going to get me killed. But not today. Lorraine Broughton, expert in intelligence collection and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Agent Gascoigne was killed last night. Did you know him? Enough to say hello. He had an atomic bomb of information. Find out who's hunting our operatives and trust no one. Persons. Your content. Welcome to Berlin. I'm David. Don't shoot. I've, I've got your shoe. You're on. That's Jesus. That was me from the moment my feet touched the ground. It's never part of the plan. It was part of mine. I've lost the target. What do you know about this woman who's been following me? You look like you need saving. <laughs> So you made contact with the French operative? Obviously.
So hopefully you notice some interesting things in watching the trailers. One similarity that you don't get to see fully developed in the trailers, but which is quite evident when watching the films, is that the opening scenes focus on Lorraine and Mary bathing or showering, putting their makeup on in the mirror, dressing, and so forth. These scenes illustrate the character's disguise and their transformation, which is something we also saw in the trailer with Theron's changing hair color. But in a scene very early in Atomic Blonde, we see Lorraine emerge from an ice bath and the camera zooms in on her bare back with her muscles rippling and her body covered in bruises. This visual is revisited throughout the film, her baths revealing her wounded body, and then she covers them all up with this iconic fashion and makeup. And in this scene, Lorraine proceeds to dress and she moves to the mirror where audiences watch her apply layers of foundation, black eye makeup, and darkened lipstick that cover her bruises and transform her into the femme fatale. In the opening scene for Proud Mary, which we get to see a little bit more of in the movie trailer, Mary showers, her naked silhouette clouded by the shower door. And then once out of the shower, she applies makeup and the camera zooms in on her lips and her lashes and her legs as the audiences watch her, like Lorraine, mold herself into a polished femme. At the close of the scene, audiences watch a transformed Mary walk down the hall in her black leather trench coat and blonde wig. 
These scenes illustrate the male gaze and the fetishization of female bodies in the films. According to Laura Mulvey, the male gaze is comprised by at least three separate looks. The first is the look of the camera at the actresses during the filming. So the choices that are made in that filming help create the gaze. And then we have the look of the characters in the film. How do the male characters look upon the women in the film? And then we have the look of the audience as spectators. And because the darkness of a movie theater invites us to immerse ourselves in films, this look takes on a potent power because as the audience identifies with the action of the gaze, women become the gaze's objects. So the male gaze, it isn't something that just happens once, like, oh, okay, we see it in that advertisement or we see it in this movie, but rather it is actually this kind of learned way of experiencing the world where both men and women and non-binary individuals um, can experience this kind of act of gazing on women as objects. And among the aspects of the gaze is the way that audiences often are invited to voyeuristically look in on female characters in their private moments. And we see that in these bathroom scenes, but we've seen it um, long before that in things even like pinup art, where uh, you would see a woman like seemingly caught bathing in a pool, um, all sexy, because, you know, that's how they do it. In Atomic Blonde, even when Lorraine is alone in her hotel room, she's often shown in fully styled hair and beautifully applied makeup, and she's poised on the edge of a table or a countertop in thigh-high fishnets, you know, what we all wear when we're just chilling at home. Um, but these stylized seductive poses, they prop Lorraine up as almost an art object for the cameras and thus the viewer's gaze. Mary's body is also fetishized through positioning and camera angles and these kind of lingering shots as she's fragmented through close-ups of her lips and her legs and made into a silhouette. And yet, for all of their objectification, Lorraine and Mary are portrayed as powerful in these films, undoubtedly so. Their skills, their strengths, and their abilities to avoid fatal injury surpass gendered limits and seem to, at times, even surpass human limits. And as is common for women leads in action movies, they embody many masculine characteristics in their roles. So they act tough, um, unemotional, they engage in physical violence, they drink their alcohol straight up, and they both wield guns, which could be considered the ultimate phallic signifier, with expertise. Both films also subtly reinforce the superhero genre, um, interestingly enough, given the time of their release shortly after Wonder Woman, um, they're framed following the same naming convention as Wonder Woman and many other superhero movies. So we have Atomic Blonde, Proud Mary, these names also start to point towards some of the differences in the ways the characters are framed and represented. In the name Atomic Blonde, the adjective atomic suggests the explosive power of the main character, while blonde is a term that's both racialized and gendered. Blonde is a hair color associated with whiteness and specifically with a universalizing construction of ideal white femininity that came into fashion in the mid 20th century United States. And we see this focus on Theron's blonde hair in the poster for the movie. The development of the blonde bombshell character as epitomizing women's desirability is clearly evidenced by Marilyn Monroe's iconic rise through feature roles in Hollywood films and the aptly titled Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. The name Proud Mary follows this similar convention, and it also constructs its hero as tough, capable and feminine gendered. But in contrast to the more universalizing blonde, the title character here is identified by name, Mary. The adjective proud qualifies the character as fierce and accomplished, but also arrogant or excessive in her power, which is a characteristic often associated with black womanhood. 
The title Proud Mary also specifically invokes legendary African-American icon Tina Turner and her popular rendition of the song by the same name. The name Mary also hearkens the Virgin Mary, potentially, which is a strong contrast from the sex appeal connected with the idea of blondes. We would, we would be remiss to not also talk about what is happening in the Proud Mary movie poster that you see on the slides. The movie posters for this film directly referenced earlier black exploitation films, including Foxy Brown, which featured the sexy gun-wielding character Foxy, played by Pam Greer. The font on this and other posters is the same font from those movies, from Foxy Brown, and the use of the afro on the Proud Mary movie poster, which is made up with a collage of images from the film, this also alludes to Foxy, given that nowhere in the film does Henson wear her hair, wear her hair in this style. Instead, she's shown wearing her hair straightened. As we think about some of the differences between the two films, one uh, very evident difference right away is the different relationships that the films focus on. Atomic Blonde, uh, one of the central relationships is the one between Lorraine and Delphine. And this is one of the celebrated relationships in the film and the one person who Lorraine seems to maybe have a hint of closeness with. In Proud Mary, the focus is on the relationship between Mary and the child Danny. So already we have then a different portrayal of the women and what's motivating them. Lorraine, her sexuality is portrayed as dangerous. And this is indicated by her first fight scene in which she kills a man by jabbing her red stiletto into his throat. The use of a fetish object like a high heel as a weapon appeals to the femme fatale iconography in which the evil seductress tempts man and brings about his destruction. While the agent David desires Lorraine during their encounter, he acknowledges the inherent danger of his passion and he sneers to her, I trust you about as far as I can throw you. Lorraine rejects him ultimately, but she still deploys her sexuality as a potential weapon against men in the film. And she winds up in a sexual relationship with another woman, the spy Delphine. In the celebrated sex scene between Theron and Butella, which was featured in the movie trailer and fixated on by the press, Lorraine wears a black dress with eye holes and lacing reminiscent of a dominatrix and forcefully pushes Delphine against a restroom wall as she kisses her and then pulls a gun on her. Given the proliferation of portrayals of bisexual women as femme fatales, scholars have critiqued this trend for echoing depictions found in mainstream pornography. In this case, as the gazes of cameras, presses, mainstream marketing materials, and audiences all fixate on Lorraine's and Theron's sexual involvement with another woman, declaring it to be steamy and hot, they shape the character's sex appeal in accordance with heterosexual fantasies. In this manner, even as the relationship between Lorraine and Delphine in the film has a little bit of queer potential, it's appropriated for the male gaze, glamorizing same-sex attraction and allowing heterosexual women to claim gender outlaw status through things like Theron's bad girl fashion. In Proud Mary, Henson also enjoys the same bad girl fashion in her tight black outfits and her thigh high boots. However, Mary's resistance of gender stereotypes is also shaped and contained by racialized scripts. Black and African-American female bodies already reside outside of the confines of ideal femininity, the way that it has historically been constructed in the United States. And their hypersexualization both reinscribes patriarchal norms, but also threatens at times to upend them through their sexual power and agency. 
So in Proud Mary, this threat of Mary's femme fatale or even Jezebel status is tamed by reinscribing Mary's body within a maternal and familial context that reproduces other stereotypical images of black womanhood that Patricia Hill Collins defined as controlling images. Mary is portrayed as the long-suffering, dutiful daughter in her relationship with her crime family who took her in when she was little and took care of her and raised her. Unlike Lorraine, she's not portrayed as using her sexuality for gain. Her ex-boyfriend Tom, also in the crime family, is in fact still in love with her, but she rejects his advances and instead all of her focus is on saving the child Danny. The rhetorical construction of her character as an asexual mother figure to a child she did not conceive echoes the mammy trope and robs her of the sexual agency that Lorraine wields. The black female body thus functions as the object of sexual desire rather than a desiring sexual subject. Furthermore, in her interactions with Danny and her placement in the mother role, Mary also epitomizes the tough love style of the black matriarch. The matriarch figure presents a strong black womanhood that is more positive than a lot of these other controlling images that Hill Collins identified. However, this image also emasculates black men and portrays black women as aggressively and inappropriately assertive. What further makes these films interesting and prototypical of the ways these kinds of iconic representations both enable and constrain the possibilities for women's representation is that both movies were to some extent promoted and received as feminist. Theron was featured on the cover of Variety where she was described as fierce and fearless in her starring role. And Henson was described in her role as kick-ass, a queen, and a feminist icon. Henson's role especially fills a representational gap and was praised by some critics and fans for this reason. And critics pointed out, typically you see this certain set of mostly white women in these roles and the same actresses are cast over and over. And so one critic noted, it's impossible to overstate the satisfaction that comes with seeing a 47-year-old woman of color show the Hollywood hero fraternity that anything they can do, she can do better. Marketing materials for both the films likewise really focused in on the ass-kicking that the film's heroes promised to deliver as a form of gendered empowerment. For instance, an interview featured Henson talking about the fighting and action in the film, and she says, F that. If men can do it, why can't we? And for Atomic Blonde, there was a promotional video that was made, actually, that was called Fight Like a Girl, and this captured Theron's behind-the-scenes training. So in these kinds of media discussions then of the film, there's this emphasis on the actresses um, as these capable fighting characters. In summary, the portrayals of women's strength in Atomic Blonde and Proud Mary offer insight into the constellation of gender, race, sexuality, and power that defines dominant versions of feminine or feminist <laughs> fierceness in the post-feminist media environment. Lorraine and Mary, as well as other dangerous dames in this genre of representation, both defy as well as reproduce stereotypical containments. They resist disrespect from men. They utilize their deadly capacities to overpower the men who threaten them. And while they do not fully dismantle gendered logics due to their subjection to the male gaze, they still offer kernels of transformation rooted in these gender deviant portrayals. They transgress stereotypical femininity despite their hyper-feminine self-presentation. And rather than their beauty being portrayed as an inherent womanly virtue, instead the captures capture their made up appearance as a costume making their beauty a symbolic weapon and highlighting its performative nature. 
Their constructed femme fatale image then is not who they are. It's ammunition against the masculine worlds in which they must fight to survive. Thank you for listening to this lecture today. And thank you to Dr. Rebecca King and the Honors College faculty and staff who have put this lecture series together. And feel free to email me if you have any questions about the presentation or the book Dangerous Dames or the honor seminar on rhetoric and the racialized other or any of the other courses I teach and things I do here at MTSU. Take care. <laughs>